Good afternoon. Looks like it's time for our meeting to begin. <clears throat> we welcome you all here. And we know, let's see, how many? We have all the council here. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I don't see Tom. So we have six council members present. That's a quorum. We're all here. Now, in accordance with uh, Electronic Meetings Act uh, under unusual circumstances, <clears throat> I will make the following statement that was prepared for by Eric Bunderson. As allowed by the Open and Public Meetings Act, the city is authorized to conduct electronic meetings without an anchor location. This authorization is based on Salt Lake County status as a high transmission area for COVID-19 as determined by the Utah Department of Health. Electronic meetings allow full participation by elected officials, staff, and the public without increasing the transmission of COVID-19. And this determination shall remain in effect for 30 days and directions to participate in council meetings are made available to the public. The watching is included on the agenda and for those wishing, wishing to participate may contact the city recorder's office for instructions on how to participate in a public hearing or make public comments. And so unfortunately, uh, a review of the state code showed that uh, we'll need to do that for each of our meetings. Just the way it is. And uh, our thanks to Eric Bunderson who got me that information. And uh, with that, then we have our minutes of October 13th from our previous study meeting. Need a motion and second on the minutes. Motion to approve. approval. Second. Okay. okay. <laughs> Two motions and one second, all right. Uh, hearing no further comments, then without objection, I will rule that the minutes are approved. Are there any objections? Hearing none, the minutes are unanimous. With that, next is our review of our regular meeting later this evening at 6.30. Uh, any questions on the agenda? My understanding there have been no changes. No questions. Then we go to awards and proclamation. Well, it's a proclamation for the extra mile day uh, being November 1st. Uh, have you had a chance to look at that? I think it's essentially the same as prior years. Okay. Uh, if the council is okay on this proclamation next week, we will simply note it and not read it. My understanding is that there will not be anyone here in our meeting representing the organization. And I do not believe any council members are personally involved. So what we will do is we will say without objection from the council, the mayor will sign the proclamation and share that. Hearing no further comments now, that will not be true of all proclamations. There are some that we have that are very much local, very involved here, or particular council members have uh, involvement with them and those we will read. 
So I will not ask anyone to volunteer to read that unless at the last minute we have someone uh, participate. <clears throat> okay, with that then we move on to our resolutions. We have resolution 20-166 to approve a grant of agreement with the State of Utah Department of Heritage and Art. And I believe it's for 55,000. And as I understand it, unless Wayne wants to make any comments, Kevin Bruder is waiting to comment on it. I'm good, I'm good sir, and I, I believe Kevin is here. He's online, yes. So Kevin, go ahead. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, the, the Maverick Center, West Valley City, has been awarded a $55,000 grant from the Utah Department of Heritage and Arts uh, for messaging, COVID messaging, uh, on our various digital and fixed fascia sign assets, both inside and outside the venue. Um, these funds will be used between now and the end of the year, and a plan is in place. We're already working towards the execution and uh, modifying some signage just to continue to provide some uh, COVID safe messaging uh, provided to us by the state. So we're excited for this opportunity and uh, again, working with the Heritage and Arts uh, Division to make this happen. Okay, Kevin, will that include your electronic sign there by the freeway? It does, it does. A matter of fact, uh, we've included some of the messaging now. We're using the state's database and rotating it through. Uh, the state is working with Penna Powers and some other messaging components. And we had a call with them on some brainstorming ideas, but it would be our, our outdoor marquee, our outdoor ribbon board um, during events and during uh, youth hockey ice times, it'll be inside the arena as well. So we're looking at uh, all options just to continue to get the messaging out. Great. Council, any further comments? Kevin, we're uh, glad that we're, you're representing West Valley and uh, getting the message out and doing your part there. Uh, you have some great assets and high visibility that will be appreciated. So thank you. Thank you. With that then, we go to resolution 20-167 to approve two subgrant agreements between West Valley City and Salt Lake County uh, governing the disbursement and use of the Home Investment Partnership funding. And uh, Wayne, any comment there? I see Heather Royals online with us. I assume that she's on there to talk about this. Yes, sir. So I'll just uh, hand the time or give the time to her if that's okay with you. Okay, Heather, go ahead. Thanks. Good evening. Heather Royal with West Valley City Community Preservation Department. What we have in front of you tonight are our annual um, home allocation contracts for the program year. It is one allocation in the amount of $198,037, but they do split it into two separate contracts now based on program type. So we have one for our home rehabilitation programs that we operate, and then another one for our first time home buyer down payment assistance programs. And it, they're pretty much the same as last year. We did take a slight hit due to the federal funds taking a hit under the home program. Otherwise, um, not a lot of change. Does anybody have any questions? Council? Well, it's become kind of routine, hasn't it? Uh, to I would have think these so, funds. yeah. Yeah. And we do appreciate the funds and certainly uh, although it's a federal program and that the county works with us on these, there have been some good things happen in our community. Absolutely. So, hearing no further comments from the council, then Heather, thank you very much. And we'll deal with that next week. Okay, next is resolution 
20-168 to adopt the annual report on moderate income housing plan. And so I'm guessing Steve is such a usual presenter, Steve Pastrick, that unless Wayne interrupts us, why we'll just jump to Steve. I'm feeling like I'm, I'm a feeling like I'm a regular. So uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this uh, item is a, it's a resolution to approve a, the report on moderate income housing. So last year, the council approved an update to our moderate income housing plan. And the state now requires that we uh, produce a report each year that uh, reviews uh, progress made on uh, implementing our plan. And so this report uh, would meet that state requirement. You can see in the issue paper, there are four items that we're required to address. So just briefly, those four items are a, a revised estimate on the need for moderate income housing in the city and a description of progress made in each of the targeted income areas. So you have um, low income, very low income, and extremely low income. Then there's a description of efforts made by the, uh, by the city to use what's called the housing set aside from uh, the redevelopment agency. And then finally, um, in state code, there are a number of strategies that cities can choose from to, to implement within their city. And so it's asking for a report on how the city is implementing those different strategies. And so um, the report addresses all four of those items. And I'm happy to answer any questions or go into more detail. Uh, Steve, that fourth one, is that the one with the uh, 20 some options and you have to pick at least what four, I think currently? Right. Right. We're required uh, to use at least four of those. But our report covers all of them. Correct. Okay. Council members, any? Questions for Steve? I have a question. Oh, good. How do we how do we go about determining what the rents are and how many units are available at each level of rent? Thank you. Great question. So the, the Census Bureau does an annual survey they refer to as the American Community Survey. So every year they uh, do a random sample of housing units within the city and well, in all cities in Utah. And um, from that, they're able to provide estimates for each um, rent group. So meaning, so for example, let's say apartments that rent between eight and $900, they'll provide an estimate on the number of units that fall within that price range. And that data is updated every year. And so we're, we use the, the census data uh, to determine how many units are affordable in, e in each of those price points. Is it specific to our city or state or is it a national uh, number that they determine? Because I, I find it hard to believe that we have uh, units really that would rent for less than $628 a month. Right, so it they do collect data at the local level. So again, it, it's they're not when they do the annual survey, they're not inquiring about every household, but they do a random sample of a, a number of households and then you know, basically make estimates based on that survey data, but it is local West Valley city data. Some of those lower rent numbers are likely uh, units like mobile homes, for example, where someone may uh, own their home, but they're renting the space to put their home. So and that would be one example. We also have a number of uh, affordable housing, like actual uh, um, subsidized uh, affordable housing projects where the, the rents are capped at uh, lower levels. If it's including a section eight unit, does it just include the tenants portion of the rent or does it include the entire rent? It, it's the entire rent. So section eight is really more just a uh, assistance given to a renter uh, that doesn't affect the, the overall rent. It's just they're getting help paying the rent versus if it's a subsidized housing development, then, then uh, people or only people making a certain amount or not more than a certain amount can actually stay in certain uh, subsidized housing projects. Would it include the per room rate for people that are sharing a house and paying rent, just having a bedroom and then shared common space? 
question on that. I'm not, I'm not sure how the census handles situations like that. So there, and I imagine that there are a number of situations where, you know, the survey goes out and, and people in those kind of situations aren't actually getting the survey. So, but I, as far as like renting out by the room, I'm not quite sure how they would address that in the survey. Well, I'm just trying to figure out why the numbers are where they are. I'm not sure that, I mean, it's surprising to me what results they found, but uh, you know, it is, it is what it is. We're given what we're given. And then we just incorporate their numbers into our report, right? That's correct. And there certainly are uh, more up-to-date numbers, for example, for average rent for the city uh, collected by private entities, but they don't go into this level of detail. And so that's why we're using census data because they provide uh, the breakdown for each of those rent groups, as opposed to just sort of an average rent across the city. Okay, thank you. Steve, does the state require that we use these federal census numbers? They do not require that. Um, so the city could collect our own data but um, again, because the, the amount of data needed to collect the, where the census data is readily available, we've historically used the census data. And I'm assuming that most cities would use that same data rather than doing the research themselves. That's right. Uh, could you help me with uh, the second bullet point, the progress made? One of the concerns I've always had with the state requirements is they treat everyone the same. So they expect an additional 5% of, uh, you know, affordable housing, regardless of how much you already have, kind of in a sense. And so in our reports, from what I looked at them recently, we usually do a comparison uh, of the percentages so that it's revealed how we are doing and how far ahead we are. That seems like there's usually three cities, uh, West Valley, Salt Lake City, and South Salt Lake that are the typically the highest number of affordable units. And I assume that's in there again this time. I didn't have time to review it. So this, for this report, uh, we only looked at uh, city data. So the, the plan that was adopted last year goes into more detail that, that does make a connection okay. between the various cities uh, in Salt Lake County. But when we did that- Okay, but so that's not updated every year. Correct. Okay, good to know. Any further questions for Steve? Hearing none, then Steve, thank you very much. We look forward to addressing it next week in our regular meeting. We'll go now to our consent agenda where we have resolution 20-169 to authorize the city to release a slope easement. We don't have very many. And now one of them's going to go away at Wood Hollow Estates uh, phase one, public unit development. Uh, and Mr. Willardson's going to address this, it looks like. You know, it's really nice when I show all the pictures with their names, makes it really easy to guess who's presenting. Um, well, unless yeah. you think I'm smart, no, I can just read and see the picture. So there's Russ's smiling face. Go ahead, Russ. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, this is uh, pretty routine. We had a, a slope easement given to the city out in Wood Hollow subdivision at the end of a dead end street. That street's now being connected to the new phase of the subdivision. So the slope easement is no longer necessary. Any questions from the council? Hearing none. That's why it's on consent, huh, Mr. Willardson? Exactly. Okay. Thank you then. 
with that, we'll go on to our communications. And our first one, we have several here, on-street parking discussion. And Mr. Willardson, uh, since you're hanging on here, I assume you're going to talk about this as well. I do have some information to share with the council. So let me uh, share my screen. And as soon as I find it on here. Okay, does that work? Can you all see this? Um, well, I can see it. I assume the others can. Okay, great, thank you. So this is just some information that we collected to aid the council's discussion on this issue. Um, a few weeks ago, the, there was some discussion about uh, modifying the city's parking ordinances and specifically to add the, um, a prohibition again about parking within 15 feet of driveways. So I wanted to show you what's already in place um, these are the existing ordinances and we coordinated with the uh, parking enforcement in the police department to make sure we got all the pertinent ones. But this first one is just, um, you know, there's currently a prohibition against parking directly in front of a driveway uh, within 15 feet of a hydrant or within 20 feet of a crosswalk or within 30 feet of stop signs, yield signs, other traffic control signals or devices. Um, there's also a prohibition on um, or a restriction on how long you can park on the street and that's you know no longer than 72 hours. And lastly, um, there's a, a prohibition against parking between the hours of eight and five uh, within 15 feet of a mailbox. So you know there's a number of restrictions already. I didn't put on here the parking uh, during snowstorms, which, is also prohibited, but that didn't really seem germane to the discussion tonight. But those are the existing ordinances that uh, parking enforcement uh, people and PD enforce right now. Russ? Um, yes, sir. Are those uh, about fire hydrants, crosswalk, et cetera, matching to, are they matching the state requirements or are they more restrictive? Um, honestly, I don't know. I think they match the state requir requirements, but I, I made a brief check in there. I didn't find anything else in the state requirements. Okay. Because um, I thought the 15 feet on the fire hydrant was smaller than that. But I've not read the driver's ed handbook for probably several decades, more like five decades. <laughs> Yeah, me neither. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I, I think um, Lieutenant Maurer might be on here uh, and able to answer some questions like that if I can't, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just show you what else we, other information we gathered. There was uh, one of the parameters that the council discussed um, using was uh, multi-lane roads. So this map just shows uh, the streets in under the city's jurisdiction that are that are multi-lane roads. And let me just correct one thing, uh, 40th West between 35th and 41 is not a multi-lane road. Um, it's, so we do have just a, one lane in each direction of travel during that stretch, but the rest of these are correct. That one slipped by us. Um, one of the other parameters that was discussed was um, restrictions on streets with greater than 35 mile per hour speed limits. So that's what this map shows. Um, all of the red streets have greater 35 or greater mile, uh, mile per hour speed limits. And the last slide I have is relates to the specific problem area and that was along 3100 South by the West Crest um, mobile home community. Um, these the green bars show the actual driveway locations and I can zoom in on that if that helps. Um, and then these red cross-hatched things, bubbles, um, show where the parking would be restricted with the 15 feet on either side of the driveway. Uh, one thing to note 
along this section of 3100 South. There, there are no um, mailboxes here. The years ago when we widened 3100 South, we relocated the mailboxes around the corners and they all have neighborhood box units now. So um, if there were mailboxes in front of these homes, you can see that uh, parking would be at least during you know business hours for the post office between eight and five, parking would be pretty much prohibited along that whole section. So you know right now with no mailboxes uh, between these bubbles, you can basically fit one car. That's uh, if, you, if I zoom in a little bit more, you can see the cars in between those bubbles. So that's the information we have, um, and. Um, if there's any questions on this data, the, otherwise I'll just turn it back to the council for discussion. Council members, comments, questions? Mayor, to answer your question earlier, I checked the statute on the uh, 15 feet to a fire hydrant, 20 feet to a crosswalk, 30 feet to um, traffic signal, and those are all the same as state law. Okay. No, that's not really our discussion, but I thought I'd just check on that because I thought it was different too. So well, now I know if I have questions, I contact you, Steve Bueller. I'll send you a bill. <laughs> no, if I do it during council meeting, you can't charge me. If I do it that's outside right. of council meeting, you can. And I can't even send you a nasty text that's uh, discoverable, so I won't do that either. Does this information cause us to uh, raise any issues for further discussion? Isn't it interesting? I got a call today from uh, someone who was complaining about the parking and it was just in a subdivision within the subdivision. One of those older subdivisions were if you park cars on both sides of the street, you, only one car can get down the, the road. So Mayor, I don't know how to address the parking for the people who live on 3100 that have all the, their neighbors parking next to their driveways practically on top of the driveways. I don't know if this is an issue during the day when our parking enforcement is working so that they can ticket and make sure this doesn't happen. Or if we need to just say no on street parking on 31 just because it's not safe for those people to get out of their driveways. I don't know. Or if we, or if we just need to, as a matter of enforcement, have a uh... You know, like they do DUI blitzes and things, just have them go out and they at 10 o'clock at night one time and ticket everybody that's uh, parked illegally. There you go. Is there any you way of the cars that do not move? Well, we, the practice the is I think to chalk the tires so that the same officer can say, hey, I chalked that tire. 72 hours ago, but that's a long time. And I don't know if we're actually enforcing it that way. I know that on 31, there's one house where it looks like the homeowners come out and painted his own no parking in this place. And, and uh, I'm sure that's not legal. And I don't know if we want to let that stand because I don't think we want to encourage it. Would it be helpful to have our staff go and paint Red where you can't park, the 15 on each side, so it's very noticeable. And then if people park there, go through and ticket them. That was kind of their warning and now, or just ticket them to begin with. Now let me well, ask you a question for clarification if I can, Mayor. So as okay. I understand it and the presentation, it is legal to park within 15 feet of a driveway currently right unless you've got some other issue like a fire hydrant being there or you're within that distance of a corner of a stop sign 
All right. So is the question, do we want to uh, further tighten up and restrict that and then mark that or just go out and paint curbs where um, it's illegal now? I would say paint curbs where it's illegal now. Okay, so that question, to be specific to that one, we have had come up in the past and arise a few times. And the issue with painting the curbs is the paint wears out. And then we've got to go back and repaint it again. And we just do not have the manpower to, to do that. But we can, and even though they wear out as well, it's easier or less maintenance intensive to go out and put up no parking signs. So we could, that is an option. I'm good with signs. We just need to help the people that live on this street live instead of exist. Is there a significant reason why that area is not, uh, what, the five lanes? I know other places along 35th. Is this a narrower portion of 3100 South? Yeah, no, it is not narrower, Mayor, but uh, I'll defer to Russ. He can give you the history going back to last time we did expansion on 3100. This was a question all the way back to then, which to my memory now is 15, 20 years ago when the last time 3100 South uh, was configured in the way that it was. So Russ, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Uh, yeah, it was about 20 years ago. Um, and at the time, um, everything east of 40th West was striped with the five lanes. And, and the outside travel lanes were right at the curb line. Um, going, you know, there was a lot of discussion at the time and we, we had meetings with the, you know, open houses and received input from residents and they were very much opposed to restricting the parking, um, you know, in these, in these areas. Um, I mean, we, the city pretty much insisted on doing it east of 40th just because of traffic volumes. West of 40th, the volumes weren't that high, and we determined that we would be okay traffic-wise um, with the, you know, allowing the parking and only having a three-lane section. Um, later, out west, uh, you know, with the development of the fitness center and and the commercial areas on 5600 West, that area was also changed to. Uh, eliminate the parking and provide an additional travel lane. It's about approximately where the at the fitness center going west is has that same five lane section. So originally this was always three lanes at the request of the residents, and um, you know we told them way back then, 20 years ago, that someday it could be um, a five lane section. But we, you know, obviously have not done that to this point, and the traffic volumes really don't demand it through this section. Um, further east, they do. So going back to the, um, you know, do we go out and paint curbs or put signs? As far as private driveways, it's just in front of the driveway. And that's what the statute says too. So, I mean, we're just talking a couple of feet from the driver. We don't have anything that says you can't, you have to be 10 feet away from the driveway or or anything like that. That's, and that's yeah. correct. So we'd be, you know, putting up a sign on each side of everybody's driveway saying don't park in the driveway, which, I mean, I don't know that people are really parking in the driveway. I think the issue is that they're parking so that they're close to the driveway and it's hard to see to get in and out of the driveway. So we'd be talking about changing the ordinance to say you can't park within so many feet of a private driveway. And then we have to decide if that is specific to 3100 South or citywide or what. Correct. That's correct. Yeah, I think for the safety of the residents on there, I think 15 feet on each side of the driveway seems appropriate to not have cars parked just because when they're right up to your driveway and the rate of speed of those cars, it's just not safe to get out of your driveway when a car is but you can't see. However, you be to 3100 or? 
everywhere. Well, I mean, honestly, in a subdivision, the speeds aren't as high. So yeah. I would think it would be tied to the speed of a street. <clears throat> so anything posted, the 35 or above. Would be no parking or would have this 15 feet. That's going to be a real enforcement challenge. For me, it would make more sense and be easier to understand if you just restricted, you know, and said no parking on those streets, not painting the curbs, but just putting up signs. We did that over here on 4700 South, uh, where there's a trailer park over in the county side, and they had already restricted it, and it solved the problem. And it's easy to enforce because you can, at a glance, tell, hey, there's not supposed to be cars there. It's just so much easier from an enforcement standpoint. And if I'm wrong, uh, you know, <clears throat> Wayne and Russ can uh, tell me, but it seems like, you know, if it's simply no parking, everyone knows it. It's not a question and it's so easy to enforce quickly because you can just immediately tell. If it's 15 feet, yeah. <laughs> that's a little bit of a challenge. It can be done, but given our small enforcement staff, I don't know that it even makes sense. But I'll tell you, as soon as those signs went up out here on 4700 South, nobody parked there. It stopped just like that. Uh, I think, and that'll happen elsewhere, but it did there. I think you're right, Mayor. I think the challenge with 3100 is the wide, the road is plenty wide and there's room for parking. And we're, we're, I think we're, as soon as we say no parking, we're gonna have all the residents at City Hall electronically telling us, hey, but we like to park, so we just don't want our neighbors to park in front of our house. Well, and, the other that thing, was, too, uh, even if we, you know, say 35 or above, does it have to have curb and gutter to have a no parking? I'm in front of my house, in front of my neighbor's house on both sides. We have no curb sidewalk. Uh, there's plenty of room there to park well off the roadway. And, but, you know, uh, and we work it uh, as we can, but there's no curb and gutter there to, to park up against. So would the easier solution just be to stripe it five lanes and then there's no enforcement issue, anything. It's just all drive. So that's a great question and it would be easier and it would ease traffic, but you probably would still have the same concern that was raised about uh, people not being able to get out of their driveway or at least feeling unsafe to do it right. so probably the most effective although there would be there would be um protest I, I believe councilman bueller was right the the most effective or getting closest to the goal would just to be to outlaw parking but leave the two lanes um not travel lanes you know, as you talk about the complaints of citizens, if I step back and I say, if safety is the issue and knowing that it is hard to get out of a driveway if there's traffic, I say, even if people complain, the safety issue is paramount. And if you follow just the safety issue of saying, how can we do it in such a way to keep our citizens safe? no parking is the simplest and most effective way, it seems like. I mean, the 15 feet could be done, but even 15 feet on a busy street, if it's filled up for a ways, is still going to be an issue. It just seems the no parking sign is a safety issue regardless of complaints. We say, you've convinced us that safety is the most important issue. Therefore, we're gonna make it safe. 
I think that's a good approach, Mara. Also, looking at 3100 South, if that's where the problem is, I would rather do it on 3100 South by signage than um, by ordinance saying, you know, we're going to include all of these roads where we don't know that we have a problem. Also, looking on 3100 South, once you get a little bit further west, there are large stretches um, where there aren't any private driveways, where the house is all back on 3100. And I don't think we need to eliminate parking there. So we need to take, you know, have our traffic engineers or somebody take a closer look at this and perhaps provide us with a proposal as to what a safety driven, no parking uh, change to 3100 South, I guess between 40th West and 56th West would look like and not just try to paint it all with one stroke. Well, and so if Council, been, 48, oh, go ahead. Just from 4,000 to 48, from 48, it just turns into, 48. yeah, and then it turns into the wider road. Is that where the, uh, the house is then back or have sides on 3100 and they're, they don't have private driveways? From 48th West, yes. Okay, so we're even looking for those eight blocks. Yeah. Yeah, like the north side of the road between somewhere. 4,500 west and 48. The north side of the road all back onto it, but the south side all their frontage is on the road. To be consistent, wouldn't we want to do that on 3100 south? where there are driveways on yes. the street. Yes. If it's the back and there's no driveways, yeah, I agree, There's, it doesn't make any sense. Well, mm -hmm. no one does it because too hard to park there anyway. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, why are we doing it on uh, uh, 3100 South? Is that because people are complaining? Yes, there's been a couple, well, there's been quite a few accidents, but a couple that I've been made aware of. And then I've just had residents say we cannot get in and out. Yeah. Uh, um, it's mainly complaint driven. Okay. And if that's the case, I think we need to do it on, on uh, 1300 West too, because people are complaining in that area too, because the entrance going to the uh, King Point area. Like last time I brought it up a couple of times. Does that make sense to you? 1300 West and what South, Tom? Uh, from 3500 South to 4100 South. Multiple times. I brought it up multiple times in the past. Yeah, man, he laughing. Yes, it's just a perfect segue. Tom, that was, that was slick. And you're right. Yeah. You're right. <clears throat> yeah. I agree. And they come to council. I remember this, that trailer park there that has them on the parking on the road. It's, it yeah. basically ends up being wherever there are trailer parks. For whatever reason, there are more vehicles than they can fit in the trailer parks. And uh, whether they want to fit in the trailer parks or maybe their carport is full of other things or I don't know, but um, you know, that seems to be where the problems are focused and where we get the complaints about there are too many people parking on the street. Yeah, I think those two areas are good ones to try it in and see how yeah. it goes and see if it solves the safety issue. Interesting. I want to bring up kind of a similar situation, but not the same. 4800 West is uh, three lanes and there's a side part that's marked and occasionally people will park there and it crosses over the side safety line, the white line into the lane of traffic. Now there's a center turn lane so people can get by them. But uh, I've heard mixed comments about whether that's even legal parking. I was told once that it was legal to park there. I use that as an example only because I see it more, but I have seen it other places. Is it legal to park 
in a bike lane or over the white line into the lane of traffic. So. Russ, now that's like a question comment for Russ. That. Mayor, I have Chief Jacobs here who uh, oh. could answer that question if the council would like. Yeah. Okay. That'd be oh. great. Let's see if I can find her. Where'd she go? <laughs> Amy, it looks like Lieutenant Maurer's on there. Oh, here she is. Okay, we're good. Hello? Okay. I think I think you should be able to hear me. I don't see a video option, so you can just listen to me. Uh, no, it is not legal to park in a bike lane and it is not legal to park in a travel lane. Okay. People just do it, so okay. Thank goodness, not very often. Well, council, now that we've had that discussion, a proposal was somewhat made to on 3100 South and on 13th West to put up no parking signs where they're, well, now wait a minute. Because originally on 3100 South, we said where the driveways are on 3100 South, but not where the back of the houses are. So how would that work on 13th West, especially by a trailer court? Cause there's no driveways. The entrance based on the entrance in and so, out. So yeah. no parking, but see there, it, how far would you take the no parking? Is that we agree on? Is that fifty feet? Is that we agree on? Is that right? Is that right, Karen? So fifteen feet on each side of the driveway. Okay. Because they put parking next to the entrance on thirty one hundred of the trailer park to keep them back um, fifteen feet so that the people coming out of that trailer park could get out with better mm -hmm. uh, vision sights. So maybe just do the same thing at the one on 1300. Yeah. yeah. With that, that. If I can jump in, Mayor, uh, that already exists on 13th West. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, the conversation um, is kind of... Uh, overlapping between the concept of driveway and entrance. It's already illegal to park within 15 feet of an entrance, which over on 13th West, as one of the council members pointed out, the houses don't back or front or have driveways. It is the entrances to the trailer park on the one side, that's the east side. And on the west side, it's the entrances and the street corner in one instance, maybe two instances to the subdivisions, but there are not driveways on there. So we could still um, mark the whole street, both of those areas, 3100 South from roughly the trailer park area and 13th West, roughly the trailer park area where the parking issue is no parking. We can do that. That's within our authority to do regardless of what the state uh, or in addition to would be the better way to put it in addition to what the state uh, statute says. But it's not the same issue from a safety yeah. standpoint. Yeah. So there are two issues. The one is uh, 3100 South where the house driveways are on 3100 South and that we post those no parking. The second issue seems to be uh, trailer parks, although I suspect it may be true of some apartment complexes where people are parking out on the road and there isn't that same issue. So there's two issues there. And the question is, how do you want to deal with those? But this, the same concept, basically just say they matter. You back out of the car, Certainly people are gonna hit you because you don't see, you know, people they come into you, may call to come into you. The same thing with the entrances from the trailer park. I know different stuff, yes, 
the, the, the same concept. The, Tom, are you proposing then not doing the whole 1300 West? Yeah, I just think near I, the entrances to the trailer park. It, I, I think they did no parking there because people they're really concerned about that. Many people they're complaining about in the past and in the, you know in the future gonna be the same. Uh -huh. So I think we're gonna uh, have them out and, and no parking there. Well, council members, how about we do this? Uh, the proposal to put up no parking signs on 3100 South, where it's only three lanes and the house driveways are on 3100 South, other than maybe a random one here and one there. That, is there anyone that would object to that? No objections. So Russ and Wayne, you've got direction. Now on 1300 West, the proposal is we ban parking there. Uh, and I'm not sure all of 1300 West, I know there are several there, but uh, to restrict parking, put up no parking signs on 1300 West. So first, let's say all of 1300 West. Is there objections to that? And I would say for this one, maybe we do it and see what happens because uh, there are other trailer parks and other places that might be a problem. But are, if we were to do that, are there objections to restricting parking on 1300 West? I, well, I think, I think that okay, let's see. I, mean, I think two spoke there, but I think it was Councilman Bueller and Councilwoman Lang. No, Councilman I did. Bueller. Okay, <laughs> so, go ahead. I mean, the way you phrased your question, Mayor, are there any objections to this? We can look at an ordinance and three of us can object to it and still pass it. I think we need to have it brought forward and then discuss it and see if we want to pass it rather than pre-pass it. Well, what I'm trying to find out is kind of the general direction. By saying objection, uh, it gives someone to say, well, so I take yours as an objection. In other words, well, we may, we'll have to do some further study, but is there anyone else that is concerned about that? Maybe that's a better way to put it. I, I, for my part, I'm certainly willing to look at it. I don't know if I would like it or support it depending on how it comes out or how it's presented or how much restriction it provides. I don't know. Okay, now we don't have to pass any resolution or ordinance or anything in order to put up no parking signs. Right. Correct. So we don't have to take any action as a council so that's true. The first one, I felt like the direction to the staff, to Wayne and his staff, was put them up. The second one, I'm getting some feedback to say, well, I'm not quite ready to do that. I want to get some more information, study it a little more. Councilman Bueller, is that kind of what you're yeah. saying? Right. I think you reframed that, and I appreciate that. If we don't have, I mean, if this seems like a reasonable action to take along that portion of 3100, then let's take it and see what sort of feedback we get. Um, 1300 West, not so sure any other place. I mean, I don't, I don't wanna just say anywhere where the speed limit is such and such because I haven't considered those other roads, but uh, yeah. so I, that's where I am. I think that uh... This is Lars talking. I think that the uh, that it, it kind of makes sense on 3100 South for the safety issue with the with the driveways. I'm not sure that it makes sense on 1300 West, where there where there's there's not driveways to houses, and we have restrictions 
at the entrances to the to the trailer parks and the subdivision. So I don't, I don't think we need it on 1300. Okay. Uh, uh, Tom, I'm, I'm familiar with that because I got a phone call last week uh, and had quite a discussion with staff uh, because there is an individual there who repeatedly brings up these concerns. And she's probably called you as well. Yeah. Well, the thing. And, uh, um, the reason I'm, I'm passionate for this because if somewhere else in this city they have like the entrances for the trailer park or some something similar to that and they have concern and they raise their concern multiple times, I think we need to look into it. We need to study and try to help them out. And this case on 1300 West, they have multiple times in the past. I brought, I brought them up to the, us, you know, our study meeting and continue to have that. How about, uh, Council, what do you think of this? How about if on 1300 West, on the entrances to the trailer parks, because there has been some concern there, not all of 1300 West, but say 30 feet from the entrance on either side. What's Instead the statute? Of, <laughs> what does our statute say about entrances 15 feet right Russ so um yeah it's not our ordinance is not I'm just looking again here um you know I, it doesn't really specify what that prohibition is. I mean, we do already have no parking oh. signs on 13th West, and I'm quite positive that that they're at least that distance. I mean, I can we can get some more information for you on 13th West and show you where the no parking ex signs are located currently. Yeah, because I, I thought we discussed this two, okay. three years ago. And we, we put out no parking signs. And uh, we went out and looked at it, and the subdivision uh, backs up right there, and it's got high walls. So, it, uh, you know, it, it, I don't see a reason to put more no parking signs there than we already have. Now, help me here, Wayne and Russ. Uh, I was told that the par no parking signs were gone. Uh, yeah, Mayor, I think you asked me that question like a week or so ago because somebody was making that statement. Is that right? Is my memory yes. correct? On yeah. So there may have been a missing sign. Uh, I can't remember exactly how that question turned out. But as far as all the parking signs that had or no parking signs that had been there before, they're not gone and they're not supposed to be. Okay. And to Don's memory, I can't remember if we actually added signs or if we just went out and confirmed that there were signs already there. Yeah, I know there were at least some signs, no parking signs that were already there. Uh, for example, on either side of the parking, I'm sorry, the mobile home park furthest to the south there on 13th West. And also there were a couple of no parking signs on the uh, subdivision walls on the west side. Where exactly there were, I'd have to go back, like Russ was mentioning, and we'd go look again. There were, there are some marked no parking zones there now. Okay. Well, let's, if it's okay, Council, then with that information, we won't take any action there till Russ reports back to us on what is currently there or Wayne. I agree with that. Let, let Russ take a look at that one and take some pictures and then we can study, we can look into it. Okay. Fair, fair game. Yeah. Okay, Mayor, so just for clarification again, so what are we doing on 3100? The proposal was to market no parking in that section that we've been looking at that's been a issue in front of Westcrest uh, mobile home community. 
And if so, is it only on the side of the street where there are, or both sides of the streets where there are homes with driveways or is it the whole section? Uh, I'm trying to make it so it's consistent. And I would uh, say both sides and wherever there are uh, driveways on the street. Is that correct? Councilwoman Lang I'm, and Councilman Bueller, you're the ones that spoke up the most. I think it's basically between 40th West and 48th West. You're muted, Karen. Karen, Councilwoman Lang. There we go. I've got it. The biggest issue is from 30, 4610 West to 4000. From 4610, there's not too many on the north side of the road. They don't face the road. So I would just say from 4610 East to 4000. And using on the one the side of the road, both sides. Both sides, okay. Both sides okay. on the you need it. Did that Mayor, help? Point? It did, but for even drilling down further from a clarification standpoint, using the slide that Russ prepared for this presentation, if you look between 4355 West and 4140 West, that section on the north side of the road is almost completely blocked if we do that. So what I would be planning on doing is making that section no parking pretty much that whole stretch on the north side on the south side it's a little more spaced and we probably could be more um tailored but on the north side of that i don't see how we do that without just making the whole thing no parking so is that okay is what okay to making the whole north side of the parking no parking from 4355 west to 4140 West on the north side of the road. Well, I think the south side is what needs the most help. Uh, not according to this slide I'm looking at. The one I'm looking at, all the houses with the driveways are on the north side of the road. There is the one just west of the West Crest. Yeah, there are two, that four, one, six, right. seven. Seven on the south side and something like three times that number uh, or maybe um, twice that number on the north side. I can tell all you. The cars, that. All the cars you see on the south side are parked. Right, so, and they're not parked by driveways. Right, because there's just the entrance to the trailer park. Mobile home park, right. So mobile that section, park. for example, we'd probably leave uh, legal for parking, but the north side we would not. Well, personally, I disagree with that. I yeah, think because that's where the problem is. <laughs> yep, the problem and all the calls I get are on the south side. So Both sides, Wayne. the seven houses that are on the south, yeah, we would still do that. I guess yep. what I'm looking for here is I don't want to go to the north side and try to put a no parking sign for 15 feet and then parking for 15 feet and then no parking for 15 feet i just want to make that whole north side no parking on the south side because there are fewer of the homes i think we could make that more specific is my point uh, mm, i'd rather just do it the same so sides. make it no parking both sides all the way yeah in it's section. just easier and clear to understand when we start doing a piece here and a piece there, I'm concerned that it will cause confusion. It's just easier to say, if there's no parking, it's both sides. Okay. Unless there's a major reason not to. Right, I'm good with that. But the understanding I had from the proposal was outside of that section we're talking about specifically, I would be going, this piece is parking, this piece is no parking in on the expanded range there from 48th to 40th. So should we just make it no oh. parking both sides all the way 48th to 40th, north and south? See, I think it would be good if we do the 4140 to the 4335. 
or 55. I have a fly in this house that's going to drive me. 4130, uh, or can we just do it from 40th West? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Because that makes it clear to people to say, oh, west of this street, the intersection, the light, you can't park, but the other side's different, so. Well, and it's basically everywhere that it's only a three lane road will be no yeah. on parking and all the four, you can't park there anyway, because it's a lane. Yeah, okay. Yep, I knew are, that. Are we there? Sounds like close, closer, so 40th West, to 4355 West would be no parking both sides and west of 4355 over to 48th West we would be doing driveway by driveway. Is that correct? No. That's okay. not correct. 40th right. West to 48th West north side, south side, no parking. Okay. Is that what everybody else was good with? I'm just... I'm, I've seen a couple of heads nod if that's not correct, speak up. I'm good with it. I'm okay. Okay, we're there, Wayne. Okay, very good. Got it. Okay. Is that all on parking for now? <laughs> I suspect, well, we know that we're going to have a little further discussion. And uh, so... Let's see, I have to stop and think because my every two, every other year parking study due yet or do I have to wait for spring? I have to remember. I've done that. I try and do that every couple of years. Yeah, it's about that time. <laughs> okay, let's not do it right now, uh, but I'll do it in the near future. It's always good to revisit that because it is an area of a lot of citizen complaints. Okay, well, that was more than 15 minutes, but uh, let's do stormwater utility update. Okay, this will be Russ, Mayor. Thank you again. Um, I'll bring up my screen here. And let me know if you see this and if the slides are keeping up with my talking. So. All right, so um, when the stormwater utility was first created back in 2001, we were uh, included in that ordinance was a requirement to give the council a presentation every year on uh, kind of where we're at and what we've done with the monies collected from the stormwater utility. So that's the purpose of this discussion tonight. Um, I'll talk about um, the finances of the stormwater utility, where we stand currently, and then a little bit about what uh, uh, what we were able to accomplish with that money, and then kind of where we're looking in the future a little bit, what we need, what I would recommend we do. So uh, this fee was established back in 2001 uh, as a way to fund uh, some of the stormwater requirements that were put up on us by the federal government and the, got passed down to the state and then down to the local governments. So we had to uh, begin a new stormwater management program, which we've talked about about a month ago. So I won't go into that anymore, but um, we had no way of funding that at the time. And a lot of cities were creating stormwater utilities and we did the same. So our current fee is $4 per month for um, single family residents. And that is prorated for commercial and other businesses um, and institutions. Uh, we do charge uh, this fee to the school district, to churches. Um, basically, we charge ourselves uh, this fee. So, um, and we have not increased the fee since 2005. Um, this, here's a comparison of our revenue. And, um, it has been pretty steady between $3,800 and $4,100, or $4.1 million, excuse me, um, you know, over the years. So we're, we do well. We collect, um, you know, 
97, 98, 99% of what we build. So we're, we do very well in that process. Um, here's our expenditures over the last five years. Uh, these vary a little bit with the size of a specific capital project that we might be doing, um, but still, again, fairly consistent. And this is where that money goes. So over half of it um, goes to um, support our people and our, and our other divisions. Um, so we do sold services back to stormwater, but this funds employees in our operations division um, and for stormwater cleaning and maintenance. It funds positions in our engineering division for uh, design and construction and also for plan review and inspections. And it also funds positions in our administration vision for the utility billing. Um, this purple pie piece over here is, uh, this is our specifically the amount that was spent in 2019-20 uh, for capital projects, which is only about half of what we normally spend on capital projects. So it was a year when we uh, did smaller projects, but uh, typically this is around $800,000 a year. Um, you can see the other expenses there as well. The orange piece is what uh, goes to the general fund from stormwater utility to cover overhead and administrative expenses outside of the public works department. Um, our fund balance also varies depending on the size of uh, projects and equipment that we purchase. So we, we dropped down to a low of about $300,000 last year. Uh, this number for 1920 has not been audited yet. So that could still change somewhat. We anticipate will be around 1.1 million um, for our fund balance, which is roughly a, a, a quarter of what we collect. Um, the capital projects that were completed during that fiscal year, of last fiscal year, were the 2700 West Storm Drain Project, which just wrapped up. Um, we did quite a bit of work to improve the storm drainage system before that overlay went in. And then last, uh, this project really finished up last year uh, was the Derby Street Storm Drain Project, which added a, uh, a much needed storm drain line in over in, uh, east of Redwood in the Chesterfield neighborhood on Derby Street. Uh, every year we purchase a street sweeper. So we have four of them. Um, we re rotate them on a four year basis. Our other uh, heavy equipment, our big vector trucks, we hold on to for 10 years before those are replaced. Uh, just quickly here, this is some of the uh, work that we do um, our street sweepers. Uh, we complete the sweeping of the city. Last year we did it nine times. It's typically a little bit less than that, usually about eight times through the city. Uh, we cleaned over 6,000 feet of storm drains and 720 feet of ditches. We don't, we don't have a lot of ditches anymore, so we don't uh, do a lot of work there. We have uh, about 8,000 catch basins, so basically every two years we are uh, inspecting those catch basins, and then we assign a crew to go clean them if they need to be cleaned. Um, on the engineering side, we look for things like what we see here in the picture where illicit discharges into the storm drain. Um, those are against the law. And problems like this where inlet protection has been on the ground or over a catch basin to prevent silt from getting in there, but this one obviously has not been maintained and needs to be cleaned. So um, you can see the numbers there. We did about eight, last year we had eight illicit discharges reported from residents, just calling in our hotline number that we then check into and try to identify the, the source of that illicit discharge. And we've actually cite people for those kind of violations. Um, looking into the future, these are, there's six and a half million dollars worth of uh, future capital projects on there. Um, with $800,000 a year, you know, we would get to all these uh, with, you know, within an eight to 10 year time frame. Um, 
but I mean, these are all current needs. Uh, what's more discouraging to me and I think needs greater attention is the amount of corrugated metal pipe that is in the ground. We don't, you know, we have not since the city incorporated allowed new corrugated metal pipe to go in. Um, as we require reinforced concrete pipe everywhere, um, which has a much longer uh, life. Uh, typically, you know, depending on soil conditions, these metal pipes might last from 25 to 40, maybe even 50 years if you're lucky. But, um, you know, the cost to replace everything that's in the ground uh, is $14.5 million. So as we, we did do an assessment of uh, all of the corrugated metal pipes that are in our inventory. Um, these over here on the right side of the slide are those that are in pretty good condition, uh, good or very good condition. We have 13,470 linear feet that are in either in fair or poor or in failed condition. So uh, those we estimate will cost about two and a half million dollars to re replace those. Um, and you know, certainly all of these, even in the good and the very good over you know, the next 10 years or so are going to need replacement because you know, we've, we've been a city for 40 years and uh, you know, so all of these pipes that are in the ground are at least that old. Um, just looking at our how our stormwater utility fee compares to other cities along the Wasatch Front, we have the lowest fee around by uh, you know 50 percent at least. Um, so others are charging much more to their residents than we are currently. Um, one of the things that I would recommend is that we take a look at that, you know, right now with COVID, that may not be the appropriate time to do that. But I, I think that's one thing that we um, should consider in the future. So that's basically the end of my slides. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll try to answer those. I would like a I better explanation of why the 1.4 million goes into the general fund or wherever it went. So there's, um, Five. I'm sorry, uh, let me jump back there and just make sure I understand your question. The green. So what does the green take care of? So that green is paying for our people. So that's the, we have about nine um, full-time people in operations that do stormwater work. Uh, um, I, it, I mean, it's, the reason I'm stumbling here a little bit is because it's not always the same people. Whenever we're working on stormwater projects, we charge that to stormwater. So you know, we also have six or seven people in engineering that periodically are charging their time to the stormwater utility as well. And, and then um, in, in our utility billing office, we have six people there and we split those costs between the stormwater utility and the sanitation fund. So that's these, this is basically labor. Okay. And then the general fund payment of 400,000? Yeah, so that money goes to the general fund and that's to cover all of the, you know, administrative and uh, overhead costs that, you know, basically we, within our department, we charge everything to the, through a sole service to the stormwater utility, but other departments, don't so like if if we need an attorney to give us an opinion uh, or to draft an agreement for us or we finance is paying our bills for us uh, that's what those fees cover okay so when we buy and borrow an engineer for a little bit of time it comes out of the green section right but if we borrow an attorney it comes out of the orange correct hmm. okay Russ? So, yes, sir. On the future capital projects, are those listed in order of uh, necessity or are they just? No, they're just random. Okay. And then the, on that list is $800,000 for Parkway Boulevard storm drain. But uh, is that 
different than the corrugated pipe or is that the same project? Is that part of the two and a half million we need for the immediate need of corrugated pipe? No, no, it's not. So the, um, actually the photo I showed you is one that we've actually fixed already. That's on, that was on Parkway Boulevard um, between 27th and 3200 West. This is out West um, on Parkway, you know, from Mountain View Corridor going west to 6400. We don't right. have any storm drain out there at all. So, so these, these future capital projects that you say it's about eight and a half million? It's about six and a half. Six and a half million. And then we have the two and a half million of immediate needs on the corrugated pipe. Correct. So $9 million. That's all. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm a resident here. I'd be willing to pay another dollar a month to get some of these things done more quickly or $2 a month or, but, uh, especially considering we haven't ever raised it and we've had that now for 15 years. Steve, I'd suggest that if we raise it, that rather than going with the $1, we go to the $2 because we don't want to come back in the near future or in the next five years to raise it again. Yeah, I, I agree. So I have a question for Russ, if I'm on, I am. So do you have a five-year strategic plan for your capital improvements or a 10-year? So those projects that are listed on there are, is our list. So, um, you know, we don't have, I didn't put years on here because they vary sometimes from, um, what we're, the projects we're working on right now are the Tecumseh Street storm drain um, and the Stanton Drive storm drain project. So those are the two that we're actively designing right now. Um, and, and you know, really, I mean, they're, they're all important. Is, so we generally, I don't have a five-year list, but I mean, this is my five-year list, but it, it's depending, you know, how much money we can cobble together to make it work. And, and that's obviously more than five years right there, so. So right now you have 1 million in there. So Pardon? I would, in your fund balance, right? You have yes. $1 million? Yes, that's correct, yes. Okay, so that goes towards these projects. I would really like to see a five or a 10 year plan if it's gonna take 10 years to do all of it with if we raise it $2 and see how much each year and what projects you would get done. I just like a plan better than just a list of, yeah, in whatever order we're gonna just get all this done. Sure, so yeah, with the- I mean, it might take 10 years. No, I mean, we can do that for you. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, with the understanding, we, oh, go ahead. Pardon? I was just wondering how much we're putting away every year to get so that, you know, we have between a million and a million seven. I mean, are we really only putting 400,000 away every year? So I'm not sure I understand. Um, so if, if I go back to, um, okay, so those are our expenditures. Not, uh, yeah, no, the, the balance. Funds. Okay, the fund balance. Right. So at 400,000 a year, it takes quite a while to build that up. And then as we spend it. Yeah, so maybe I wasn't really as clear as I, have been on that. So we have approximately 800,000 that we budget every year. Um, and, you know, if we, if we spend a little more than 800,000 on a capital project, then that eats into this fund balance, you know, and okay. it'll take it down to, you know, a number like this, $300,000. If we do, like last year, we only did $400,000 of 
capital projects or fund balance jumped up significantly. So, you know, we'll plan to use this money in our fund balance. But I mean, I like to keep some money in there just as a cushion for us um, in, in case a project comes in over budget or our revenues don't come in quite what we think they will. Or yeah, a surprise just, emergency. Right. Where something fails. Yeah, I guess I'm just getting off because we had 300,000, then all of a sudden we had 1.1 million. That's not 400,000 in one year deposited there. So I'm just wondering how much over we're billing anyway. I mean, how much we're collecting more than we need. I don't know. So, yeah, I, I would say we're not, you know, we're, we're certainly not collecting uh, more than we need. Uh, okay. This, the reason for this big jump in the fund balance is just because we were we were doing some major road projects this year and we only did a couple of storm drain projects. So, you know, typically we would spend, um, you know, 800 to a million, 800,000 to a million a year and you wouldn't see this big jump. You would see just these little ones like the 1.4, the 1.7. Well, we're just, yeah. I mean, what we were staying at basically, correct? Right. Right, and because okay. we did a big project and we spent a lot of money, a lot. yeah, dropped that fund balance down, and now now it's back up again, and and we'll plan to use that. But I mean, I don't really like me getting down to this three hundred thousand is getting a little on the low side for a fund yeah. balance. Okay. And Russ, looking at your five year expenditure, it looks like you're spending. You know, if I kind of roughly look at it, about $3 million a year on storm drain. Um, well, it's, it's, we're bringing in. You said 800,000, but your five year expenditure comparison. Yeah. And you show each year, that looks like you spend around 3 million yeah. a year. No, you, you're right, Mayor. The, the 800,000 I was referring to is on capital projects. Uh, okay. So also depending, your balance could be affected not just by capital projects, but by your operations as well. Yes, that's true. I mean, not as much. They, obviously, they don't vary as much as our capital projects do, but yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll go back to the budgets of past and then I'll have brain wrapped around a little bit better. I won't ask any more questions. Council, uh, we can do nothing with this report or uh, delay for a while. May I make a suggestion, which you're perfectly welcome to shoot down. So. Uh, you know, get your darts ready. Uh, I would suggest that we approve a $2 increase with a delayed effective date. In other words, let's approve it now, but have it be effective and I will arbitrarily select March 1st of next year. What do you think of approaching this that way so that we get beyond the COVID-19, but we don't come back and revisit this again when we have the information so fresh on our minds? I think that's a good approach, Mayor. Um, I was thinking the same thing because we've had the discussion, let's take the action. Although whether the date is March 1st or July 1st or uh, January 1st, I mean, I'm not sure what the appropriate date is, but I think we ought to take the action now um, for a future date. So okay. the pulling two dollars out of a hat, I would really like a five to 10 year plan of what projects we need to do and really what we need each year and see if we need to start with a $1 increase and then after three years, 
it's up more or if we can get a million dollars worth of improvements done every year to get this list of his done. I would like a more detailed list of what we need and how quick we need it because maybe we need to go to $2 or $3. I don't like just pulling a number out just because I would rather have a strategic plan of exactly what capital improvement projects we want to do and in what time and when we'll need what money. I, uh, well, I, I actually agree with Karen. Uh, need more detail and we, we support uh, our public works. Well, we are going to get that report from Russ and we could present that at the same time. Here's the issue. <laughs> When you go through the pain of raising a fee or a tax, uh, traditionally the council has done that less frequently. So they didn't have to uh, fight that battle multiple times. Right. I don't know if that's the case here, but typically on these types of fees, you want to project into the future, not just what we need for the next two or three years, but what will we need over a longer period of time that will effectively create a stable plan for five years minimum, if not longer. But I'm happy to get that information and, uh, and I'm looking here, Russ is just sitting there waiting what amount of time would you need to have that, get that information together? Um, Reasonably. I mean, realistically, I can do it in a couple of weeks, but um, so whatever time frame the council wants to consider, we'll, we'll get that report to you and, and, uh, and then get it on your agenda, so. Okay, can we say that uh, within two weeks, You'll be sure. able to put that on and okay. yep. now I notice Wayne file got lost in the forest, but uh, I am here, Mayor. I'm, I, oh. There's something to do with my lighting that's not showing me, but I am here. Yeah. Mm. Uh, maybe maybe we need to stop and then we need dinner because he's fading away. Okay. Thank you, Russ and Wayne. Uh, Next, we need to take just a couple of moments on closed meeting procedures. Uh, Eric brought to my attention uh, the issue of we're now electronic and having watched uh, uh, several of you and I've even had it happen to me during regular council meetings, uh, one of my family members will come up and deliver me an urgent message or something like that or just want to say hi because they stopped by. Our closed meetings are required to be only council members and staff members required to be present. So what I would suggest is the following. Uh, and this, of course, I spent, <laughs> Eric gave me all kinds of good ideas. So we can thank him for a lot of it. First of all, when we go into a closed session, it's the responsibility of each of us on the council to ensure that first, you're alone in the room and the room is closed. It would not count if you're sitting at the kitchen table and your family is in the front room and you don't have a closed door between you. It must be separate so that they cannot hear. If it would help, you can use earphones. But if, second, if for any reason, a family member comes in, doesn't matter the reason, uh, then that council member would be responsible to say, interrupt the meeting and say, hold just a moment. Uh, it's not enough to put you on mute because they can still hear the discussion. So you mu we must actually stop the meeting. If you're comfortable with that, that's fine. Now, if anyone has a problem, 
that they can't do that, I suggested a backup procedure to be that we allow time for a council member to go to the city offices, find a vacant office, open up their iPad and sign in electronically there where they can close the office door. Except in emergencies, uh, I talked with Wayne and he feels that we can usually do it that we would inform the council when the agenda is published, typically if we're going to do a closed session or at least uh, enough time before meetings start that a council member can decide if they're gonna stay home or try and find a secure location. They've told me, uh, for example, the mayor's office has a door and I'm not there. So one of you could use that. The counts, the, uh, one of the conference rooms could be used. Uh, or even if we needed just to ask someone to use one of their rooms uh, or their office during council meeting, that could be arranged as well. So that's the information. Anyone have concerns about that? Do you feel comfortable with the closed room and interrupting the meeting if someone enters? Now, we don't have a lot of closed meetings, so it's not a big issue, but if anyone feels that they need to, we can always do the other. And in fact, maybe at the end of our next 30 day uh, electronic council meeting, we might want to talk about uh, an anchor location. I don't know. You I know, know Mayor? I, yes. Uh, that's exactly what we do now even when we're all meeting together in a closed meeting, if somebody opens the door, we stop. Yeah. Yeah. So we're just saying we have to carry that out to wherever we are and it's no biggie. Yeah. Well, it's a little different when you're at home, <laughs> you know. Well, yeah, we have to interrupt in. somebody to talk. Yeah. We have to interrupt somebody to talk. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, there's that. And then you heard my little statement and we'll refine that each time a little bit, but I'll do that again in our regular council meeting about the regular meeting, the COVID-19 or the electronic meeting disclosure. Any issues on council calendar? I have a question, Mayor. Oh, sure. Are we meeting on election day? You know, traditionally we've often not met. So unless someone wants, I see several heads shaking no, but so if we follow tradition, we would not meet unless someone raises an issue why we should. Mayor, I just wanted to note really quick that uh, we don't have a meeting actually scheduled. Um, we canceled uh, meetings for all election days um, a couple of years ago. So um, if we did want to have a meeting, we would just do a special meeting, but there isn't one currently scheduled. Okay. okay. I appreciate that. I just wasn't clear from looking at the calendar. Okay. We're, I'm going to hustle right along. We're almost mm -hmm. out of time. Uh, future you agenda so items. Are oh. you purposely missing the COVID update? The COVID update you should have all received. Okay, you're just not bringing up. Okay, it just got skipped, so I didn't know if you were going to talk about it. No, I actually, I, well, no, I, I'll tell you something about that offline, okay? <laughs> that works. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the the potential future agenda. I, I have a couple items. I want to bring it back and bring it to, to you tonight. And I need your help. The first thing is a live band. And the second item is a ATV wheelers. And they have multiple uh, places in my district. People are really concerned about this. And uh, I know that our city is, uh, we have a very diverse group here in the uh, in our city, multiple uh, ethnic groups here in our city, and I they 
keep their culture and they, their way of life. But uh, at the same time, we need to respect other people around in our community. So we need to put something here. And first, I think is uh, we need to bring it up to study for next uh, meeting for good and communication or somewhere we can study in there for this. And also ATV wheelers and a support on the street for race on the street because so many children, so many kids on the street and then they're concerned about and run, someone can get hurt. And that's not very good for young uh, children on the street. And uh, those people, uh, those people arrive, that's the ATV wheelers, they're very young. I mean, they're just under 14 or 10 or, or 12. And that's very scary sometimes. Uh so what we should do is have a communication item, you're saying, to inform us of what the current code requires. There's a lot of state regulations governing that. For example, if it's not street legal, they're not supposed to be on the street, period. Yeah. And, uh, but if it is street legal, uh, my son has a side-by-side, -side, similar to four-wheeler, but two-seater, uh, and it's street legal. Now I had to go in and add modifications to it, but it can be driven on a road. And it has to be licensed that way. Right, I have a license. Anyway, so yeah. why don't we have staff do that, but let's let them have a little bit of time to work on that unless it's an emergency. The problem wasn't gonna go away. Uh, at least we, uh, we bring it up and we study and try to figure out how to tackle all this. Okay, and you said you had two. What was the other one? Uh, live band, they play live band. Music, uh-huh. Okay. So we can talk about noise So people having big parties at their house, Tom, and having a band or? Yeah, they, they, uh, they, they have a big party and uh, they went, you know, kind of like, uh, uh, went off the track. Uh, too late and so loud. And okay, so uh, do you just want an update on, because we talked about our noise ordinance yeah. recently. And we so did. you want to talk about? We did also in ordinance, it's a mention about if they disturb people around our area in area and up to past 11, I mean, 10 p.m. And they're not supposed to do that too. Uh, but I. Are yeah. you proposing we change something or uh, we, we, have, we to, have talked about that? Yeah, we, we have to, we have to enforce the law. Uh -huh. We have to enforce the law and we have to uh, restrict on that, try to do something to stop that. You know, at least we have to do something. It, 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 we can respect other people around in our community to do that. I know I, I, I have you know, I still carry the culture you know, from Vietnam, but the thing is that I adopt things here in the U.S. very quickly too. We, we have to respect other people. We're not gonna play so loud music at night before they cannot sleep. Or it's, it's not right. It's not right. Well, okay. <laughs> Maybe uh, some further clarifications because you know, that could mean that you want to hire more officers because currently we don't have it. I'm not quite sure which direction you want to go mm -hmm. on enforcement. We, we usually have the a community police officers and they target in a, each community in a, in a city, right? Uh, they, sometimes they speak their language too. Um, so we need to have that group of police officer to go into the community and explain to them about that. And that's, uh, that's how maybe pass information to community. But, but I, don't, I don't, so I wanna, something like that to support the police officer to do something like that. Or a part time uh, restaurant people that will retire from police you know, office and they, um, they wanna come back and do something, maybe part time job, we can have them out with that. Uh -huh. Okay, so a communication item to uh, explain what we are currently doing, what options we have for enforcement of uh, these parties, loud noise, uh, late hours kinds of things. 
and what it would take if we were to increase that enforcement and how, maybe how many complaints we get before we go any further. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, I, I think that's fair, but uh, the complaint is very much almost every week and uh, they're not very good. Yeah. Well, I'm the wrong one to ask because uh, it's always too loud. If they're playing music, it's too loud for me, period. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what kind, if it's classical or anything else, it's too loud. But here the band, <laughs> that means real loud. <laughs> That's why we're gonna have the communication <laughs> item. Mayor? Yes. Mayor, uh, one, other poss Don. Possible, one other possible communication item. I just got a uh, Facebook post, or my wife did, that said, anyone know why they're digging up the new road on 4100 South? So I think we need a report back from the uh, contractor as to what's going on because it was supposed to be finished first of this month, middle of the month, at some point, and they're still digging it up. So I think we need a, to get a, I, I know I've talked to Russ about it, and I know what the answer is, but I think we need to make it a communication item so it'll go out to the public too. Okay, a, an update on uh, 4100 South, including those types of items and also right. when they'll be finished, how it's going for the, I know a lot of work on the sidewalks. Yeah. And, trees and, and I know, you know, I'm on their email list and I haven't got anything for the last couple of weeks saying what's going on. Last time I got one, they were going to be finished by now. So I, I, I support that because I want to know about that too. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Hearing no further ones, are there any needed council reports? Just if a quick not, one, Mayor. Just a quick council report. I attended the Western Growth Coalition yesterday. Uh, UDOT told us that uh, they will be opening up the environmental impact study for the rest of the intersections on Bangator this year. So that I'm sure Public Works knows about that. And they also announced last year, we did a special letter to our legislators uh, saying what each city wanted and what the asks were during the session. And they told us to get that list in because they will have some money in the session apparently that they'll be able to spend on us. So uh, if we could get that list in, I'd be happy to pass it on to Western Growth. That's it. Other than we had a great health and safety fair mon yesterday morning. I learned a lot of things there when I went uh, that I've passed on to family members and that. And it was a very, very well run and very informative time. Okay, thank you. So I was just gonna say real quick, went to the play last night and it was very good. All the employees, volunteers that were there were very helpful, led people around. I think the social distancing worked really well. So I think that group working on that should be commended for that. It's a really good production. Thank you. Anything else? Then motion to adjourn. Without objection, we will stand adjourned. There were no objections, so we are adjourned. It was unanimous. And we'll see you in about 10, 15 minutes. I got to go get a snack.